So I'm going to talk this time about um, the integration of belief uh, as an aspect of practice. So we've talked um, in three successive weeks about different levels of integration. So I talked about integration of desire, which is more immediate form of integration, integration of our energies, uh, so that we come into an immediately more focused, concentrated, mindful state. Um, and integration of meaning last week, which is very much about having more meaning resources available to us so we can imagine more freely so that we can bring together ideas so that we have resources for thinking differently when we need to do so. Um, <clears throat> but the integration of belief is the, the final level and in some ways the most crucial. <clears throat> so um, first of all, I think we'll need to clarify this term belief because it is used in all sorts of ways um, in different sorts of communities of discussion, really. <clears throat> uh, so you may associate it with church and religious belief. Um, and I often find people immediately jump to that conclusion when you mention the word. Um, but I'm using it in a broader way than that. Um, so, yeah, belief relates, first of all, to meaning that I was talking about last week. So I would see belief as uh, meaning that is entrenched sufficiently to be used practically uh, as a view of the world that we act on. So, so if you think of meaning as um, the ways that experience has etched itself into our mind brains, um, created all these connections through experience so that we um, create have lots of associations with different things that we encounter, different symbols and objects that we encounter. So out of that, though, some of the, the channels of meaning become particularly entrenched, particularly important, and we use them uh, in order to act. So, so uh, we become practiced in acting as though the world was that way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's built on meaning. We need meaning to be there first in order to develop beliefs. Um, so, so that's a, an account of um, meaning and belief, which is based on the embodied meaning thesis, which I said a little bit about last week or two weeks ago. Now, uh, other thing about belief in the sense I'm using it is it, it could be implicit or explicit. Um, so, I mean, obviously, sometimes we talk about our belief. We say, I believe this or I believe that. That's the explicit side. But most of the time, our beliefs are implicit. Um, so we show through our judgments what our beliefs are. <clears throat> so um, obviously, you know, if you're kind to somebody, that suggests that you believe uh, that they're maybe that they're a good person or it's a good idea to be kind to them. Yeah. So, so there's um, lots and lots of implicit uh, assumptions that we can take to be assumed when we act in particular ways and when we make judgments. Um, belief is also about everything. Uh, so we have a belief, for example, that there's a, there's a table in front of me and that I'm sitting on a chair which is not going to collapse when I sit on it. Those are all beliefs. So it's not just God exists or that kind of belief. And also um, there's a lot of um, different ways I think that the term belief is used in relation to knowledge. Um, so the way I would understand knowledge is, is that knowledge is justified true belief. So, so it has to be true if uh, you're to refer to it as knowledge. Um, so in a previous talk, I talked about skeptical arguments, skepticism, um, and the basic uh, recognition of uncertainty in relation to our beliefs. So that's why I tend to avoid the term knowledge in relation in this connection and talk about belief. Because belief is much more realistic. Belief is what we assume uh, knowledge. If it's knowledge, it has to be right, basically, um, which we can't rely on at all. So um, 
instead of talking about knowledge, I'd rather talk about belief being more or less justified from our experience, or indeed that experience can come from other people, but by our experience. Um, so so um, the great uh, 18th century philosopher David Hume um, came up with a, a saying, which I think is very helpful here, which is quite a simple one, although it's in 18th century language, a wise man proportions his beliefs to the evidence. Um, obviously that applies to a wise woman as well, but the key point is that um, <clears throat> the idea of the incrementality here, so, so uh, we are justified in believing in proportion to the evidence, so, so we believe to a degree or we're justified in believing to a degree according to the extent to which our experience justifies us in holding that belief. Now, obviously, um, there are lots of complexities we could go into that. What we mean by experience does also draw hugely on other people and on our surrounding culture and so on, but we still have to work through our experience to understand all that. Um, so um, very often people are obsessed with whether beliefs are true or false, but since we have no final way of knowing that, um, I think it's more useful to, to think in terms of conflicts between beliefs. So that's where the idea of integration of belief comes in. Um, so uh, if our beliefs conflict, then we can tell from that, we can experience our beliefs conflicting and identify a problem readily through that. So we don't have to start off with an absolute view which we would really have to uh, know from a kind of divine standpoint really what whether we were right or not whether we well, belief was true or false but it's much easier for us as uh, humans who are subject to, to error and uncertainty um, to identify whether we have a conflict between our beliefs or not um, so um, how would you know you had a conflict? Well, I'm talking about conflict in two sorts of ways. So, so it could be uh, the most obvious sort of conflict of belief you'll probably think of first is between individuals, two people arguing on the internet, for example, um, about what is true, you know, whether the Chinese deliberately started COVID or not, or whatever, you know, whether it's a conspiracy theory or, a, or even a well-justified perspective, but either way you can dispute beliefs in that way and have a conflict about them. Um, now, uh, but you can also have that conflict within yourself. Um, so in the shape of, a, of an inconsistency over time. Um, and um, that often manifests itself in, in the shape of flipping between opposite points of view or, or, or inconsistent points of view. Um, so you sometimes get this, particularly say somebody who's trying to give up an addiction like smoking or something like this. At one point they may very strongly feel they want to give it up, but another point they're right back. You know, so, so the belief that it's good for them to have a smoke becomes dominant instead of the, um, the belief that they should give up smoking. Um, so our beliefs are closely connected to our desires and the meaning we can draw on. And um, you know, obviously you could also get into language about the unconscious and so on, but you don't necessarily have to get into that just to recognize that we are not always consistent. Our beliefs move around. Um, we flip between different beliefs. So therefore we have conflicts. Over a period of time, we can recognize conflict of belief. Now, <clears throat> What will connect there with what I've been saying in previous weeks about uh, absolutization. So, so the middle way is the middle way of avoiding absolutization, whether positive or negative, trying to find a way between those two uh, opposed absolutes in any particular case, in a particular judgment. Um, and it's uh, absolute beliefs which are uh, make it 
impossible while they remain absolute to um, reconcile a conflict. So, so an absolute belief is one that assumes it has the whole story, it has this totality about it, this idea of completeness, um, and this blocking off of alternative possibilities, uh, apart from you know, the unthinkable negation, the unthinkable opposite, which we can't possibly accept. So, so um, conflict of, of belief, therefore, I think we, we need uh, to understand is due to absolutization. If we don't assume that our beliefs are absolutely true, um, then there should be some kind of door opening available to us to reconsider them in relation to each other, um, to examine them, see where they're coming from and what will be a more justified belief that can help to reconcile that conflict. So absolute beliefs conflict, but provisional beliefs have the possibility of reconciliation in a way that absolute ones do not. So how does that reconciliation occur? Um, I think basically by contextualizing. So um, provisional beliefs can put conflicting absolutes in a bigger context. Um, so rather than being caught in a limited framework where we assume uh, that we know the whole story and we get into a rigid argument between two opposed views which take that story for granted, we're able to re-examine that frame by putting it in a bigger context of awareness. Um, and, um, you know, you, you can <clears throat> think about that both internally and externally. So, so if you're trying to meditate, for example, and you're caught up in a hindrance, you may get conflicted about it, but that won't help you. You can make your awareness bigger. You can contextualize it, perhaps using your body. <clears throat> if, if there's a dispute between two people, then again, if you contextualize that dispute, um, <clears throat> you can start to uh, question the basis of the dispute and its, its um, entrenchment. So how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> well, this is where the, the levels of practice come back in. So, so I talked previously about um, the, uh, the roles of mindfulness and imagination. All of this really helps or can help um, to uh, put things in a bigger context. Yeah. So, so we can become aware of the limitations of our beliefs. Um, we can access other possible ways of thinking. And we can um, get enough immediate consistent awareness to, to put our intentions into operation more consistently. So, so if you think about um, mindfulness, a more mindful state can help us to be more consistent because we've got this, um, this larger bodily awareness to fall back on, which, which puts the, the conflict and ideas into context uh, in the immediate, in our immediate awareness. And the imagination puts things into context by giving us alternative possibilities. Um, but, and then we, but then we also get the more intellectual aspect of this, which is uh, particularly concerned with being aware of the limitations of our beliefs, being able to go through a critical process. And that's where skeptical argument obviously becomes important. Some awareness of the limit, you know, why our beliefs are limited, what's, what's wrong with assuming that they are total. Um, <clears throat> so kind of practices I've talked about in the last couple of sessions are obviously going to help with integration of belief as well. So mindfulness can give us uh, a wider awareness, but the effects of it are, are temporary. So I've certainly known people who meditate regularly but seem to have really quite rigid views still. It's not a magic bullet, a silver bullet or whatever it does. Meditations 
really good, but it's not necessarily going to um, deal with uh, conflict of belief. Um, I could say the same about imagination. So imagination provides us with necessary resources, but we have to be able to use those resources. You could argue that, that there are many artists who don't really make use of the huge imaginative resources at their disposal. Um, <clears throat> but then the uh, so so the other level which haven't hasn't been talked about in the last couple of sessions so much is working more directly with our beliefs and, and that's what I would call critical thinking you know, as, a, as a general description. Um, so you can find critical thinking skills, uh, you can develop critical thinking skills. Often, often people de uh, develop them in quite indirect ways through, often through their education or through other kinds of activities that, that cause them to think and reconsider their ideas. Um, but they can be taught or learned quite explicitly. So, so um, in um, some of my previous experience, you know, I taught in a, a sixth form college uh, where I taught A-level critical thinking. Um, and so uh, at that point, I was um, yeah, that was very helpful to me to have to go through that process of finding out how to teach it and, and um, what the process was that the students needed to go through to develop those skills. So um, to finish off this talk, I'm just going to share with you a diagram about what critical thinking involves. Um, Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, in the middle you'll see the question, what is critical thinking? And um, another question you could maybe add to that is, or is it critical feeling? Um, so there's this, there's an educational tradition really of thinking perhaps a bit too narrowly in terms of thinking rather than feeling. But I think that the critical perspective applies to, to both. And there's a, a recent, very interesting book by a psychologist called Rolf Raber, which is called Critical Feeling, uh, which points out that really quite a lot of what we might be doing uh, in what is sometimes called critical thinking, at least in a wide sense, is actually applying awareness to your feelings and you know, engaging, uh, understanding and giving a bigger context to uh, assumptions you're making, which are just as much emotional assumptions as, as they are cognitive ones. So um, one thing, one of the many things I'm trying to do is, is to broaden the understanding of critical thinking um, and uh, unite it with the idea of critical feeling. Um, so this, these six points are just to sort of break down, I think, of what is involved in critical thinking skills. And I think the most important one is the, is the one at the top, so assumptions. And you can hopefully see directly how that might help with the middle way. Um, <clears throat> so recognizing our assumptions is perhaps the most valuable thing, I think, in critical thinking, um, which means, in fact, that we examine implicit beliefs. Let me give you a simple example from which I've used in critical thinking teaching. So if I say, um, <clears throat> John had better look out. There's a polar bear behind him. Um, now, probably most people, when they hear that, will immediately envisage John maybe standing in the Arctic somewhere and there's a polar bear right behind him about to grab him with his claws. Um, but of course, those are all assumptions I mean, that that's what's happening in that sentence, which is ambiguous. So the polar bear could be in a zoo behind a, a wire mesh, or it could be a mile behind John, or it could be dead or stuffed, or John might be wearing protective equipment, or you know. So, so there's there's all kinds of different possibilities which might make it less important for John to look out. Um, and we make these assumptions all the time. Uh, they may be very deeply entrenched or rarely examined assumptions, or they may be more closer to the surface. So teasing them out, becoming aware of them is part of a critical thinking skill. Um, 
looking at reasoning is, is the thing that people most often associate with critical thinking. And I think it can be helpful, but it's often overemphasized. Um, but yes, having a sense of how our beliefs linked together, how we can justify one belief with another belief and how people do that in arguments. Um, and then the context. So uh, people have different intentions and different expectations in different contexts of what an argument will offer them. Um, and um, so for example, if you're arguing in scientific context, people will have different expectations from an you know, artistic one, say. Um, but um, we also need to sort of uh, critical awareness of the limitations of that context. So, so we can just get carried away with um, what people think there, but not consider what they might think somewhere else. And interpretation is a crucial one. So if you think of people taking offense unnecessarily, say, um, which is quite a major issue at the moment, um, then obviously that depends on the skill of interpretation and of interpreting in a, a balanced or open enough way so as not to cause unnecessary conflict. And credibility. So when we look at sources of information, do we assume that the source of information is necessarily correct because it's by an expert or it's in the Bible or whatever, or do we assume it's necessarily not correct? Both of those will be absolutizations. Um, so thinking in a proportionate way about credibility is really helpful. And then bias and fallacy awareness. So, so this brings together the tradition of talking about fallacies, sort of mistakes in thinking as uh, known in philosophy with bias, which is psychological investigation of mistakes in thinking. Um, so there are lots of identifiable mistakes in thinking which uh, can all, in my experience, be correlated with absolutization. Um, so my book, The uh, Middle Way Philosophy for the Integration of Belief, includes a long survey of these. So I'm not going to say much about them, but they if you want to investigate uh, a particular bias or uh, fallacy, it will probably be in there uh, in relation to the middle way. Okay, so I must stop there. I'm over time probably, but um, that's, um, yeah, just by maybe to bring it together very briefly. So, so the, um, yeah, the, the integration of belief uh involves obviously everything we've discussed so far really in the whole series um but it's probably the most important it's the, it's the sort of furthest point if you like um whereby we reconsider our um the basis of our judgments um it's also um potentially challenging and uh, intellectually challenging at the same time, it's possible to engage with it at a different level. I think. So it does have a shallow end as well as a deeper end. Uh, but it's it's important, particularly I think, to, to try and integrate this way of working with the other ways of working with mindfulness and, and the arts. So not to think of them too much as entirely separate processes. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So. Um, Time for questions or, or thoughts. But one of the things you've um, not really alluded to that um, that um, Robert is that you know being wrong is often painful, um, hmm. and um, presumably. Well, my feeling is that the more that you cultivate the practice of provisionality, uh, the easier it gets. The the the, the more you uh, you more comfortable you become with that 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 dissonance. Yeah, I think maybe to some extent. Um, certainly, I guess be, being uh, able to engage in discussion without taking offense that kind of thing 
to some extent, people who do it a lot maybe get used to it, but you can also see them taking offense as yeah. well. Um, so so um, maybe a bit of mindfulness also helps a lot with that, mm -hmm. um, in my experience. So that so the least defensible people I know tend to be Buddhists actually. So, so people or people who meditate. Yeah. Maybe because of that. Certainly the from my point of view, the recapitulation of this um, theory underpinning the integration of belief helps. The more I've heard you talk about it and the more I've looked in the book or watched the video, the more I can understand it. And it, it begins to register with some of the um, ups and downs of my own, my own existence. <laughs> One, one thing that occurred to me when you were talking about the, the, the way the conflict occurs uh, in individuals, between individuals, I can understand that, you know, disagreements between a couple about how they should bring up their kids or how they should spend the money or not spend the money. There's a commonplace. Um, and on, on social media, you see plenty of evidence of people in conflict, with, in conflict with others about everything under the sun. And then you talk about the conflicts within oneself, and you gave an example of uh, inconsistencies over time. Um, you know, chopping and changing your mind about whether it's good to stop stop smoking or lose weight or things like that. You know, sometimes it. The evidence is for in favour of losing weight, and sometimes the evidence is against. Never mind, never mind. Bugger is, I'm going to, I'm going to stay fat. It's good for me. But another, another evidence, another manifestation of, of stuck, to, of, of a conflict of belief in individuals. It seems to me is a sense of stuckness, a, a, a pervasive sense, hard to define fear. Of, Something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with my life. And I can't put it into words, but it's there. And it seems to me that that is also perhaps evidence of a conflict of belief. And how to get, how to get in touch with that is another matter altogether, mm. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I expect one, sorry. Go on. Yeah, I mean, I expect there'll certainly be psychologists and psychotherapists who have more to say about that. But, um, but uh, yeah, we could talk about repression, for example, and ways that, that um, one belief can impose itself on another. Um, and I suppose all I'm really contributing to that long-standing discussion is is just the idea we don't have to talk about um, ourselves. That we don't have to sort of use the self language in that those terms we can just talk about beliefs being in conflict with each other um which i think can be helpful there but but um yeah so so you can have um repression things that are sort of half emerging but again they, they're only really um you can only really think about them and engage with them because they've become conscious in some way to some extent um if you feel stuck or someone else is pointing out that you're stuck um or you've um, reacted irritably to somebody, so you didn't realise that you had a conflict there, which is making you irritable. Um, or um, you have a peculiar dream. I mean, so there's, there's um, you know, the whole psychoanalytic aspect of this, where uh, people have looked for, for conflicts in, in um, you know, more indirect but, ways, like, like yeah. dreams. But some of us, and I would suggest many of us, um, can't get in touch with the source of the conflict. They can't identify the beliefs that are in conflict with each other. They're not accessible to discussion. They're not not accessible to introspection or rumination about what's wrong with me. Or where have I gone wrong? <laughs> was I dropped on my head as a baby? Or was I molested as a child? Or what was it? You know, did I get a bad deal at school and never get over it? 
these are the things that are not accessible, and yet they're pervasive and they st they stick. Certainly, in my own experience, that's the case. I've never never been able to get rid of the fact that there's something there's something wrong with me. There's right. something wrong with me, and I don't know what it is. Right. <laughs> right. I'm just yeah. other people can tell me, and they do sometimes tell me, and I can see the things that they tell me are right, but that doesn't help because they're not the things I'm thinking of. They're not, they're not the things, that, the fact that I'm selfish and introspective and grandiose and show off a lot and I'm not very loyal to people, those are faults. But what's wrong with me to be like that? That's what I can't get in touch with. Yeah, so, so maybe a challenge to, to try and articulate what the belief is that is in conflict with, with your more dominant beliefs. And I mean, that's where maybe uh, practices like focusing might be helpful, you know, to sort of uh, identify a almost physical feeling or, a, or a, uh, a slight sensation or something like that, and tease out mm. maybe with the help of a of a focusing teacher what it means, um, or what further significance it might have. You can also have a yeah. focusing buddy. It doesn't have to be a sort of a hierarchical relationship. You can be two people who are interested in focusing and that your your peers yeah, yeah. okay any, any other questions uh, or thoughts from anyone else uh, uh, Mark? Robert, could i ask a question sure uh, i like the way you're uh raising the issue of uh feelings critical feelings not just critical thinking um, and it, 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 may, it reminded me of in, in looking at the, not just the, the main video for this week, but the, but the related ones on uh, cognitive bias and other um, errors that um, belief, prior belief systems can cause in us, that a lot of um, our biases and belief frameworks have to do with our sense of identity. What, what groups do I belong to and how I feel connected to, to larger ideas and value systems, mor moral systems. And in religious terms, maybe also in some secular systems, it can involve a sense of uh, being watched or judged too either spiritually, you know, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my, in, my internal theater, as I call it, might be watched by a super being or a kind of paranoia about that in our current, you know, society with so much, so many cameras and internet connections. Um, so I'm wondering about how belief comes to figure in 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 that uh, in those webs of identification, and and the positive and negative feelings involved, um, is it is it a kind of balancing act to find the middle way, um, and, and 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 while resisting the, the security and the connection that a uh, you know j just buying into a set of uh, ideals in a belief system, it, it can be very tempting to, to many people, especially politically or, or with, you know, when, when people did go to churches and religious services, how much um, feelings of connection and meaning that can give, but then, you know, it comes with a set of principles of how to think. Yeah, yeah. sure, there's, there's a whole lot more to say about um, the social and cultural aspects of this, certainly. Um, yeah. Try to be given an outline briefly, but 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 um, the, the way I'd see uh, absolute belief specifically is that it has this um, strong connection with groups and the ways in which groups can uh, create coherence and obedience. Uh, you know, they can have a shortcut to coherence and obedience and power um, through the use of absolute beliefs, which are shared by that group. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've um, 
often speculated a bit about this and, and maybe I'll write down my speculations role at some point, but uh, the ways in which this might have developed, say in the Neolithic, as, as states were beginning to emerge in, in human uh, history, uh, when there were, you know, it became necessary to mobilize large groups um, of people who, who didn't maybe feel much solidarity with each other um, <clears throat> in a more embodied way, but you know, so you had to get a quick way of getting an obedient army together. <laughs> um, what better way than give them an absolutization? Uh, they all believe it then. Um, and there's this social pressure to maintain that absolute belief because your acceptance in the group depends on it. Um, it's, it's the condition of your involvement in the group. Um, so obviously you can encounter that today in all sorts of groups, religious, political, whatever. Um, so, and obviously also those absolute beliefs get ca carried on or they get passed on through cultural traditions. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, it's important not to identify those traditions as a whole, just with those beliefs, because the cultural traditions themselves are the base are a result of human beings associating over time in all their complexity, including their provisional aspects and their embodied aspects, as well as the, the absolute elements of our experience. Um, so, um, and I think it, it is possible for humans to engage with each other on the basis of solidarity rather than power. Um, but uh, this may be a matter of degree, you know, we may not be able to get rid of power entirely. But uh, so, yeah, I don't know if that's, that's a pretty brief answer to your question, but I hope it, it might help. Oh, we seem to have lost Mark now. It's the connection from America. It's gone. Can you it's see gone. Me? Oh, you're there. Sorry, you just moved. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Mark? Is there anything else you want to come uh, back? Yeah, I guess it was. It was. I was asking several questions at once, so I, I didn't phrase it very well. Mm. But I, I'll keep thinking about it. The, the main concern was, yeah, the group identification factor mm. in in beliefs and how, uh, for me, Buddhism and maybe now this Middle Way society is helpful mm. in in resisting more absolute beliefs because there is a kind of comfort in being told this is the way it is or you know, yeah. feeling our kind of righteousness regarding moral principles. Yeah, yeah. Great, okay. Um, George. I yeah, question. just wondering, Robert, um, thanks very much for your talk. Um, if you could say just a little bit more about what a critical feeling is. I'm not aware of ever noticing a feeling that somehow speaks back to me, um, criticizing yeah. in some sort of way or... You know. oh, well, it's not, it's not that you're being critical of your feelings it's more that uh, the critical process of becoming aware of your feelings I think is, is what is meant there um, so obviously some feelings are more helpful than others you could put it that way just as some some beliefs are, are more helpful than others um, and the two are really inseparable so so uh, supposing you have um, I know a, a kind of um, yeah, but you're in a loop, you're in a, a feedback loop of hatred with somebody. So, you know, thinking um, thoughts about them, about what they're like, and your ideas about their hateful characteristics keep feeding back into what you'd like to do to them, etc. So, so if you're in that side of state, obviously that could be described in terms of the beliefs that are going around in your head, but they could also be described in terms of your bodily states and your feelings. Um, so you can approach it either way and to get a kind of critical handle on that hatred and to, um, yeah, you could, you could do that intellectually. You could say why hatred isn't justified in the context. You could also do it by finding those feelings in your own experience through focusing or some kind of psychotherapy or whatever and engaging with it that way. And that will be a critical process as well, I think. Okay. Um, but uh, I mean, the scenario I, I really need to explore more myself, I think. Um, so, th so there's a, a new body of work, I think, developing on interoception, the practice of interoception. Uh, 
so, so you can get training on this, I believe. Say it again, Robert, please. Oh, uh, interreception. What did you yeah. just say? Interreception. Interreception. Interreception, yeah. So, so basically looking internally, becoming aware of your body and what your body is telling you. Um, so, so now some people are offering training in this, which uh, sounds like a very fruitful uh, form of practice, which is certainly a, a, an addition to meditation and mindfulness. Anyway, I'd really better stop there. Um, so uh, let's go on to our... Good night, Richard. Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer's just leaving, right. Okay. Um, I better stop recording.